Breaking the Cycle of Violence in Garissa County, Kenya. I trust that you have read the case. Uh, Garissa is, is an interesting study that shows, as you have read, you know, what is possible when authorities make a meaningful attempt to regain public trust. The study highlights the positive impacts of a new strategy that tackled abuses by security forces and restored trust and partnership with the population, leading to a marked decline in attacks and to improve perceptions of security. So as you have read, and you will hear from our distinguished speaker in a minute, this is by no means a CVE job done, a counter-environment extremism job, job done. If the window of opportunity for building a more durable peace, as you read, as you have read in the study, is not quickly grasped, attacks could return, and the local solidarity in rejecting violence could evaporate. Yet, the significance of the case study is that it affirms what we have learned in the five modules we have covered so far. Traditionally, counterterrorism practices have involved little consultation with local communities, and they have rarely taken into account communities' diverse needs, concerns, and perceptions. The belief was that enforcement activities, intelligence gathering methods, they always must take priority over the difficult task, the arduous task of gaining public trust and earning or at least endeavoring to earn the support of local communities. And the limitations of these methods, we have seen them. We have discussed them in the last five weeks, and they have highlighted, once again, the necessity of drawing on the support of local communities to successfully counter, counter violent extremism and terrorism. In other words, communities you know, must be stakeholders in the articulation and provision of security. They can't just be simply passive objects uh, of law enforcement activities. And this is what community policing is about. This is what this program has been about. At its core, we have learned and discussed the ethos of community policing resides in inclusivity, dialogue, and trust between security actors and local communities, particularly those most vulnerable or exposed to vulnerability and violence. So as we have seen and as we have discussed, the logic behind this is quite simple. In many low trust settings, as the case we'll discuss today, where policing you know, is or was not closely integrated into local communities and where law enforcement have or had little legitimacy and credibility, the ability of security act to identify and enhance community safety issues and social orders and their mind. By contrast, in areas where security actors adopt community-oriented approaches that prioritize public participation and support, their efforts, as we have seen, tend to have positive impact. So at their best, community policing approaches deepen local ownership. They foster trust. I emphasize the word trust here, because that word has come uh, many times during our discussions. It fosters trust between security actors, local authorities, and populations that have been marginalized uh, and that have been hard to reach. But again, that requires hard work, as we will see today. It requires significant organizational transformation. It requires fundamental change in, in policing practices policing cultures. It requires the inclusion of marginalized voices. And this in turn necessitates naturally su sufficient resources, but most importantly, political will. So implementing a community policing approach to preventing and countering uh, violent extremism and terrorism is naturally a complicated, uh, difficult, and multifaceted process that demands the effective engagement of communities, as well as sound changes in the structures and management styles within law enforcement and other relevant uh, uh, security and government agencies. 
So naturally, there is no a one-size-fits-all approach to community policing. Each context has its own unique features. There has also to be uh, realistic expectations about what community policing can accomplish, especially as it pertains to preventing counter and violent extremism and terrorism. So community policing, as we have discussed, cannot act as a panacea to violent extremism and terrorism, but it can help build public confidence in and support for security actors, provided, of course, that communities are involved in the formulation and implementation of locally tailored strategies. So to achieve its full potential, community policing must be embedded in and guided by a comprehensive and holistic citizen security oriented strategy that tackles the underlying causes of violence and security. As you have read in today's case study, and you will hear in a second from our speaker, you know, in, in the case of Gerasa, to keep the momentum to secure the security gains that have been uh, gained, the government, local authorities, and their international, international partners also, they must sustain those new governance and security approaches that have been created and that have been targeted at Kenya's marginalized communities. So we're privileged today to have Chris Wakubi with us. I mean, he's one of the authors of the case study. Chris Wakubi is a senior program manager with Equal Access International uh, uh, in Nairobi, Kenya. He's a peace building and project management professional with 18 years experience working on various projects, ranging from child protection, peace building, election peace and security, community security, and preventing violent extremism. And he's currently managing projects that provide alternative narratives to young people at risk of radicalization and recruitment by violent extremist organizations. Previously, he has worked with Safe World as Kenya County Manager, Head of Office, and with Pact International as Senior Program Officer. Chris has also undertaken consultancy assignments involving trainings, evaluations, and research in Kenya and the East African region, including South Sudan, Sudan, Somalia, Rwanda, and Ethiopia. He's also a member of the Peace Actors Forum, the Dialogue Compacts Group in Kenya and a board member of the Universities and College Students Peace Association of Kenya. Chris holds a Master's of Business Administration from the University of Nairobi, Kenya, and a Bachelor of Philosophy uh, from Pontifical Urbaniana University, Rome. Uh, he's also PMD Pro One Project Management for Development Professionals Certified. So Chris, welcome. It's a privilege to have you here with us. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anno. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, I'm quite happy to be here to be so, able to just discuss. Thank you. Okay, very good. All right, Chris, please uh, briefly explain, you know, what happened during the terrorist attack on Kenya's Garissa University in 2015. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Anwar. Um, yeah, so... The Garissa University College uh, attack, now it's a university, it's Garissa University, uh, is one of the major attacks, terror attacks that have happened in Kenya. Uh, it happened in uh, April 2015. Um, and uh, during the attack, we had four gunmen uh, from Al Shabaab because Al Shabaab claimed responsibility uh, for the attack. So there was, uh, uh, the gunmen took hostage, uh, the students separated Muslims from Christians and mostly shot the Christian students. There was an initial response by the security agencies, uh, but then the, the gunmen, I think, had taken a lot of vantage points, so they were able to keep off the security agencies for quite some time. And uh, it took the intervention of uh, uh, I would say an elite police unit 
coming from Nairobi, the capital city, uh, to be able to come and uh, deal with the gunmen. So the whole operation took the whole day. And uh, of course, uh, at the end of the day, there are also complaints uh, around why it took very long for the police to respond, and especially for the elite police unit, uh, which is a uh, police commando unit, uh, from what we call the record squad of the general service unit. They were able to respond and neutralize the gunmen, but that was in the evening. At the end of the day, we had 148 people killed, uh, 142 students, and about uh, uh, three police officers and three soldiers. Um, the biggest challenge and uh, one of the things that uh, uh, people asked questions there were reports that actually there was intelligence, the universities could be attacked, and uh, even that particular university college could be attacked. So questions, uh, of course, came out, and uh, why then was this not acted upon? And uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of the actions which were taken by the government following the attack to just change the security infrastructure. So it's one of the saddest uh, attacks that have happened to Kenya, one of the most deadliest, uh, uh, at least uh, as in, the, in the recent times. And uh, it brought about a lot of reflection, not only from the government, but also from the communities and citizens, what more could be done. So in a nutshell, that was the Garissa University uh, attack. Okay. Thank you, uh, uh, Chris. Can you discuss the factors that contributed to the change in Kenya's counterterrorism strategy as applied in Garissa after Shabab's attack on the university? Yeah, so uh, first of all, of course, the Garissa University attack, like I mentioned, uh, brought a lot of reflection within, uh, within government, but also within the communities. Uh, when we did this study, uh, whatever I'm sharing was based on what the communities told us and also what the authorities told us. Uh, because we went to Garissa, we interviewed several people, young people, community members, members of the security, and members of the administration. Uh, but to, to respond to that question, uh, maybe it's also good to have a bit of an understanding of Garissa County. Uh, Garissa County is one of the counties uh, in Kenya. In Kenya, we have a devolved system of government. So we have 47 counties. Uh, Garissa is one of them. Uh, Garissa is at the border with uh, Somalia. Uh, and uh, before independence, uh, actually, there were some three areas which were considered part of the northern frontier districts. Garissa was one of them. And because it is predominant, uh, inhabited by the Somali community, uh, there was an expectation that maybe it would be part of uh, Somalia. But then that did not happen because it was decided that uh, uh, Garissa and the, other, and the other North Frontier districts would remain in Kenya. So at the independence, there was already a bit of a struggle in terms of uh, there was a war that erupted called the Shifta War, which was uh, basically uh, because there was a feeling that uh, uh, the region should secede or become part of Somalia. And then there was a lot of response, uh, military response by the government for, for quite some time. So you have to bear in mind Garissa is a place which right from independence then we've had this struggle and uh, there was even an initial war. But then come when we were doing the, the research, actually one person told us, wait a minute, Garissa in 2010 was voted by Interpol one of the safest cities in the region. Um, but then one year later, when uh, now the Kenya Defense Forces went into Somalia and Al-Shabaab uh, started a lot of or intensified their campaigns, then Garissa would be one of the centers for uh, a lot of attacks. So by 2012, we had numerous attacks happening in, in Garissa. In fact, 2012, uh, as we were doing the study, we realized 2012 was, uh, uh, there was a high number of attacks. So you can see from 2010 to 2012, a, a very big shift. And of course, uh, we were given numerous incidences of attacks that were done by Al-Shabaab during this period. 
And uh, uh, like there was one incident in November 2012 where three Kenya Defense, so uh, Defense Forces soldiers were actually shot in Garissa uh, while they were changing a tire for one of their vehicles. And uh, this triggered a big military response and, and operation. So if you look at the, uh, the history of uh, before even the Garissa University attack, there was a lot of uh, count attacks and operations by the security forces. So Al-Shabaab did many attacks and the security forces tried as much as possible to do many operations to deal with uh, Al-Shabaab. Um, speaking to the communities, they had a, a bit of grievances for the kind of approach that was being deployed, especially by the security forces during the time. Uh, there was a lot of resentment because they felt uh, many people were uh, maybe arrested, young people, people were beaten up, uh, people were profiled, and there was also reports of corruption. So you can see uh, even before the Garissa University attack, uh, the communities felt not the kinds of operations happening uh, were not uh, to their best of interest, were alienating them from the security forces. And so when attacks were even targeted against maybe police or military, some, some locals felt they were indifferent. They didn't, uh, they didn't see it as their problem. The other thing is uh, Al-Shabaab also tried to, uh, uh, to also uh, attack uh, establishments which were thought to be, for example, uh, 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 for example, an uh, Muslim or anti Muslim, for example, sh uh, some shops owned by Christians or even some bars and such like. So there's a bit of feeling okay, this is not a problem. The security actors, we are not happy with them. Uh, these other guys are Christians, we are not happy with them. So there was a lot of indifference. But when Garissa University attack happened, uh, there was a bit of shift even in the understanding that no. This is not even what, uh, for example, Islam stands for. This is not uh, uh, what uh, we, should be, uh, we should be indifferent to. And so there was a bit of the community, the community leaders coming together with the government and other agencies. Now, um, one of the things that uh, 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 contributed to the change of strategy, uh, especially on the government side, actually came from the community, the leaders themselves. They told the government, look, um, we are having all these challenges in terms of your security approach. And one of the biggest challenges they pointed out is that in the leadership of the security, uh, they didn't have somebody who understood the community and who was from the area. So they actually recommended that the government should consider uh, like its policy of deploying uh, security personnel from a different region, uh, because that has been the government to avoid a lot of familiarity. They say, no, give us a person who's from the Somali community, who can be able to understand us, and who can be able to improve the relationship between the security and the communities. And this is what uh, I would say the, the government decided, okay, fine, uh, there was a major attack here, for sure. Our strategies, in a way, are not very effective, then we need to do something different. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Chris. It was interesting how people identified uh, in 2012, November, as the first turning point. Is following, as you described, the killing of, uh, of three of its men. The army reacted by burning the market in Garissa town, you know, by, uh, uh, by shooting local residents. And this was a moment, you know, when indifference, as, as you said and, and you wrote, became became an, an tenable. I mean, the, uh, the community started to feel that anyone who looked like a Somali or a Muslim was taken into custody, young or old. So it is at this point that local religious leaders, you know, felt impelled to impress upon their communities that this is all about us. But at the same time, you know, as, as you mentioned, and as uh, documented in the case study, that's when interfaith uh, uh, meetings uh, started. So it was interesting that change came from, from the community and community leaders themselves. And they are the ones who called that, that uh, unless something is done, obviously, uh, uh, things are, will, will escalate and, and will deteriorate uh, 
uh, further. Uh, so, Chris, if you can elaborate a little bit on the on the changes and, and examine the organizational and management changes that occurred, you know, within the security sector after the Gorissa attack. We know that after the attack, popular revulsion at the attacks, there was shock and the recognition of the shortcomings of the security response, I mean, triggered a, you know, I, th I think it's fair to say a remarkable change in uh, in a pro security provision was restructured. So if you can just walk us through, uh, through that, please. Chris. Okay, thank you, Anon. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> so against that background, uh, you can understand there was frustration uh, amongst everybody, uh, the government side, the security side, uh, but also on the side of the community. And like you pointed out, there was this realization that, uh, wait a minute, this is not just a problem for somebody else, this is all our problem. So uh, one of the things, uh, the, uh, of course, you, even, even the cabinet secretary or the minister who was in charge of security then uh, uh, admitted there were gaps, there were, there were things which did not work out very well. And, um, and of course, everybody had seen the story. Everybody had had how it took from 6 a.m. up to 6 p.m. in the evening for the issue to be resolved. Uh, there are issues around why couldn't the police be transported there uh, quickly enough and all this. But then there was also the question of, uh, and, and, and even when we spoke to the, to the community members at the time, there are those who felt there are people who must have known these attackers must have been somewhere. Maybe they slept somewhere, they stayed somewhere. So there's also a feeling that uh, maybe some people did not uh, give out the information uh, for various uh, reasons. Uh, but one of the things that uh, the government did within uh, just a month of the, of, uh, after the attack was uh, the president appointed a new regional commissioner. So a regional commissioner would be in charge of a particular, we used to have provinces, so a regional commissioner could be in charge of uh, several counties. So in this case, we had a regional commissioner for the northeastern side, uh, looking at uh, Garissa was one of the counties and uh, this particular uh, regional commissioner. And the regional commissioner used to be a provincial commissioner uh, uh, many years back. So he already understood the area, uh, he was a Somali, so he was also from the community, and he was a respected person within the community. And uh, once he was appointed, uh, he, he brought a bit of a change in the way the security was being handled in the area. First of all, uh, he helped, and according to the people, he helped to heal the relationship between the government security agencies and the community in a nonpartisan way. Um, if you look at what uh, was reported about him, was that uh, he was able to, to build on two things, trust and accountability. Uh, trust between the, uh, the agencies and the communities, but also accountability. And uh, many uh, credited him for unblocking the obstacles in the command structures, because the other thing that uh, was, uh, was was coming out as part of the challenges was even communication within the various security uh, command structures and especially how they link with the communities. Uh, people accredited him for transcending clan divisions. Uh, Garissa County, uh, uh, yes, it is predominant Somali community, but even within the Somali community, there are various clans. And these clans also have a relationship with clans across the border in Somalia. So there has also been those uh, uh, clan dynamics which was hindering the kind of collaboration that would be there between communities and government officials. So he was able to transcend this. And one of the things they credit him for was also to deal with the corruption issues among the security agencies and also the issue of indiscriminate arrest of young people because that used to be one of the complaints. So in a way, he was able to listen to the communities, hear their grievances, and then act on this on the side of the, of the security agencies. Now, the government, uh, some years before, had introduced a new community policing program called Numbakumi. 
uh, that is Swahili. Uh, actually, this model was also borrowed from Tanzania. Nyumbakumi basically means 10 houses. And the idea was for every cluster of 10 houses, people are supposed to know each other and report any suspicious activities. Um, Nyumbakumi had started off, I would say, with mixed uh, reactions in different parts of the country. And when we spoke to the uh, communities in Garissa, by the time the Garissa University attack had happened, those, those, it, was not very, it was not working well because of this lack of trust with the security uh, uh, agencies and especially the police. But then with the coming in of the new regional commissioner, he was called Mohamed Saleh, he was able to then revitalize these structures, the Nyumbakumi structures. And because the communities could see him acting on the side of, so it was, it was not just a, a one-sided affair. Uh, they could see, yes, he was dealing with the issues they were complaining, whether it is the arbitrary arrests, whether it is the corruption, uh, or whether it is the profiling, then they were also able to reciprocate and also start becoming active uh, within these structures. And um, he also uh, acted on the response ability of the, uh, of the police. Uh, when we were there, when we talked to some of the police commanders, uh, when there was an issue, he was able to deploy the response unit and also the rapid response unit of, of, the, uh, of the police services that we have. Uh, but then they also changed their approach. Most of the time, if people had the police were coming, they would run away. So one police commander was telling us how one day they went to a location after they had, it was reported there were suspicious people in that area or at an attack would happen. So when they landed there, people started disappearing, but they called the people back. No, 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 come, come back. Today we want to hold a meeting. It's called the Baraza locally here, which uh, was very surprising. People were not used to seeing police call for, for meetings to, to discuss anything. So if you look at uh, some of these changes, I would say, uh, uh, yes, the new regional commissioner, uh, Mohamed uh, Saleh, was able to work on the fundamentals of uh, what is essential for community policing, which is being able to uh, bring trust between the, not only the security agents and the communities, between all the actors, but secondly, to deal with the issue of accountability and also the recognition that uh, partnership, this can be a partnership. So people started seeing themselves as part of, uh, of this partnership and they started seeing themselves that uh, they could report issues. And by the time uh, we were doing the research, actually people pointed out that since he came, the tax uh, went down uh, and this was supported. So if you look at the number of attacks which were happening, uh, maybe uh, from 2012 to 2015, and the ones which were happening maybe between 2015 and 2017, actually the attacks had reduced. It does not mean things were completely okay, but uh, he had already uh, built a bit of, uh, of a system and brought relationships to be, to be quite positive. And once people saw that, then they also were able to reciprocate and also be more forthcoming with the police and more seeing themselves, seeing security as also part of their priority. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it, was, it was really interesting to, to hear you uh, talk about how Mohammed Saleh, to read also how he commanded respect because of uh, first, who he was, right? He was an Ogden in Somali, but also his track record. Many people uh, that you that you talked to, that you interviewed, uh, you and your colleagues, they spoke about his positive role, as you said, in healing the relations between the government, security agencies, and communities. And he did it in in a nonpartisan way, right? Which was uh, which, which was critical. Uh, some credited him with unblocking obstacles within the security uh, services themselves. I mean, command structures, how he restored the relations uh, between the national and the county government structures, uh, I mean, how he tried to, to transcend clan divisions, and, 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 and he tried to cut through what you 
described, you know, corruption, which is institutional corruption, bribery. Another uh, uh, point that you mentioned, which is important, and we dealt with it in the program as well, is that uh, how the signal, you know, that was sent by his, you know, clamp down on indiscriminate arrests of young people. Uh, is in many parts of Kenya, as you said, the public has good reason not, not to trust, right? I mean, the, the police, not to trust that community policing model that you talked about, the uh, Yomba, uh, but, but at the end of the day, the trust in, in Salah, the person, enabled people to, to, to trust, you know, in the police uh, community, uh, uh, the Nyamba Kum. So rather than work primarily, as, as you said, through these highly militarized police units, through the army, uh, his model was to work through as documented in your case study through the administration police and, and those who are much closer to, to communities. It was interesting to see how he set up, you know, little things, that direct line for the public to reach his office, to ensure that nothing gets stuck at the wrong level because of corruption or inefficiency. Uh, so the, the, I think the, the primary success, as you stated and documented in the case study, was how he managed to replace that forceful approach, you know, the use of excessive force with one that is based on those two words you mentioned, critical ones, trust and accountability. You know, that's what helped build the relationship with, with local communities. And this takes me to, uh, to my last question. Uh, Chris, could you discuss the benefits of this changed approach, you know, to countering uh, violent extremism and terrorism? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Anon. Yeah, you've rightly pointed out, um, yes, uh, for him, uh, and I think for the change of approach was, and what we learned even from the study was uh, a, forceful, a forceful approach might work to some extent, but uh, an approach based on trust, accountability, good relationships with the community will go even further. Um, I would say some of the, of the benefits of this kind of approach uh, was one, this approach then makes uh, security a collective responsibility. And uh, then people start feeling, which I think is important even when you talk about community policing, the fact that people own their own security and people are able to prioritize their security needs and people see security as being part of their uh, responsibility. In Kenya, uh, we have a division of uh, functions. The national government has functions, county government has functions. So security was retained as a national government function, but everybody recognizes without security, even the county governments cannot uh, function. So when it comes to security, it's more of a, of a partnership, even if it is the responsibility of the national government, the national government cannot do it alone. Uh, with this system, um, then you have improved relationships between the, the community and the security agencies. And when we did the study, this is something we had from the young people, and we also had from the security uh, agencies themselves that relationships had improved. Both sides were able to listen to, to each other and were able to jointly deal with uh, issues. Uh, but the other uh, big benefit and lesson we also got is that uh, uh, there is possibility of what uh, we bring from the hard security model for reacting to terror attacks. Uh, if you only employ a hard security and which most of the time victimizes the communities, then you end up without uh, the desired results. But if you use a different approach, then even those attacks will be prevented in the first place. Uh, the other thing which we had, uh, and, and there was a study which we read by ISS, which actually indicated that uh, for Kenya, some of the people had even joined uh, Al Shabaab, for example. Uh, felt they were motivated by the approaches of the security agencies. So this study was there, and, and, and some of the people actually we interviewed said, yeah, you know, when, 
when you feel that you're always the one being victimized, you even start feeling you need to revenge. So using a proper approach also avoids alienating young people who then feel pushed to join uh, some of these uh, uh, terror groups. Um, the other thing we, we, which we, uh, we thought was important from the Garissa case study was, yes, uh, Mohamed Saleh was a good leader. Uh, he deployed a good strategy, but everybody recommended that what happens when he leaves. So there was this aspect that you need to institutionalize some of these approaches so that it is not dependent on one person rather than you work on the institutions. And uh, most people recommended that tackling corruption, inefficiency, ending arbitrary arrests and beatings, then creates channels of communication and accountability in the communities, which then bears good uh, results. So uh, there is need to <clears throat> look beyond the individuals and look at how we build better institutions. And I, I was looking at least in around 2017, uh, the Kenya National Police Service issued a booklet on community policing. And in this booklet, uh, they, they put four things they recognize, which I thought uh, correlate with this particular case study. First of all, they said that police as an agency is not the sole custodian of national security. Uh, and then there's need to expand the role of police mandate beyond the routine crime control and that local community is best placed in understanding their security concerns and the need to establish and retain police legitimacy by upholding the rule of law. So if you look at those, those are things which are now outlined in the Community Policy Handbook uh, by the National Police Service. And these are some of the things which are already in practice in, uh, in Garissa at the time we did the, uh, the, re the research. But one key thing to realize is that uh, we are not saying Garissa, uh, the, the Garissa case study uh, is, that is the template to use everywhere. Uh, we are not saying that, uh, uh, that this model did not have deficiency. Changing cultures is, is important. Changing behavior is important. And things can be context specific. Uh, we work in different contexts. Kenya is, uh, has varied contexts. Uh, when we did the research in Garissa, we also had done research in another county. Later on, we did another county's context change. But some of the basic principles still stand. And when I was looking at even this uh, community policing handbook and some of the principles which are there, they are the same principles which were being deployed. One, partnership, uh, collaborative efforts. Second, problem solving kind of our approach where you solve problems together and also what they call police transformation. So a shift in change in, uh, in how in the behavior. Uh, and this is something that uh, even uh, can be seen in other uh, contexts where we, we've, uh, we've researched or even worked that you can have the same principles, apply them in a specific context and things will, uh, will work. So these are some of the benefits which then are able to, uh, to accrue by using a different uh, approach. And this was backed by uh, data. When we looked at the data, if you look, if you look at the, the uh, maybe the number of attacks, the quantitative data, you'll see that when this approach changed, actually the number of attacks went down. One respondent told us, uh, Following the Garrison University attack, there were several, not only the police who were activated, but also the military. So there were also roadblocks uh, put up by the Kenya Defense Forces just to check and ensure they are able to monitor. But because of this kind of approach, then the roadblocks had reduced over time. So which means they felt that things were becoming more and more secure. So these are some of the kinds of benefits that can be there uh, when we use a, a very different kind of approach. Uh, to dealing with uh, security uh, challenges. And, and I would say, uh, because now I work with um, uh, an organization, Equal Access International, we are still dealing with the same issues. And in Equal Access International, we've seen 
the issue of behavior change. In this case, it's a good example where the authorities changed behavior and the result was uh, uh, something that was a, a more positive situation for everybody. So those would be some of the benefits which uh, uh, could accrue from this kind of uh, an approach. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, fascinating case study. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the most important lessons and gleaned from, you know, the counter-terrorist operations in, in Kenya and frankly, you know, elsewhere is that military operations uh, uh, alone cannot stop the spread of violent extremism and terrorism. And even when successful, you know, uh, uh, in clearing areas of violent extremist organizations, governments that fail to improve local governance uh, including in the security sector, end up unable to sustain uh, those those military gains. So, I mean, the apparent success and uh, of the changed approach to security provision in Garissa is important, because as you said, and you emphasized uh, in the case study, it illustrates, you know, what is possible when there is this break from the hard security model for reacting to terror attacks. As you said, you know, the security approach is, is important, but, but, uh, but you can't rely on, on, on a hard security model uh, by itself. So in many places, as, as you documented in that case, is, uh, in the case study, you know, we see governments uh, are supporting these counter-violent extremism initiatives, right? To try to uh, dissuade people from joining or siding with violent extremist groups. But unfortunately, these efforts, they often are often, as you stated in the case study, rendered ineffective by these repressive methods for attacking the problem. Uh, so no one should, uh, as you said, idealize the Garissa story uh, or claim that the problem is, is uh, that's it, it's resolved, right? But nonetheless, you know, there are lessons we can learn. It shows what is possible when uh, authorities, they make meaningful attempts, you know, to try to regain uh, public trust, or as you, in your own words, you know, to uh, not to fight dirty. So the, 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 you mentioned also the issue of they trusted the man, right? But you emphasize that it's, that's critically important that, you know, we have to institutionalize the changes, right? that were introduced in this case by a respected local security leader. Because as you said, Chris, then what happens when he left and he did, then, then what? Uh, so tackling corruption, you know, uh, uh, inefficiency, ending arbitrary arrests, the beatings that you talked about, creating those channels of communication, and, and your word again, accountability and trust. You know, when that happens, it does achieve, achieve results here. Uh, uh, but, but obviously, the, the problem of violent extremism is much bigger, and to tackle it, it, you need to adopt a more holistic approach. We know that in Garissa, as elsewhere, you know, uh, uh, there is a lack of infrastructure, unemployment is, is very high, uh, health and education services you know, are in, in bad uh, uh, state. Uh, so we have to demonstrate to the residents of, in this case, Garissa, to both Somalis and others, to Muslims and non-Muslims, that, that they have the same rights, right, as, as others. Because that's how the ISS study you referred to when people join violent extremist organizations, in this case, Shabaab, yes, because of the repressive apparatus, security apparatus, but also, you know, because of of the belief that they are marginalized, stigmatized, discriminated uh, against here. So many uh, uh, Somalis and, and Muslims in Kenya, they feel like second class, or at least the perception, you know, that they, that they are second class citizens. So to make progress uh, on, the on the integration of Somalis and, and Muslims, you know, the long-term marginalization of, of Garissa, uh, has to be tackled. It has to be to be uh, to be addressed. Uh, 